The debrief is a production of faculty at the National Security Affairs Department at the U.S. Naval War College. The views presented here are those of the speakers and do not represent the positions of the Department of Defense or any of its components. Welcome to the debrief, where we deconstruct defense, diplomacy, and developments in national security affairs at the U.S. Naval War College. I'm your co-host, Theo Milanopoulos. Most commentators view Washington as hopelessly polarized, impeding the kind of cooperation necessary for leaders to work across the aisle to achieve American objectives abroad. New research, however, challenges this conventional wisdom, drawing on decades of congressional voting to reveal that Congress continues to be surprisingly bipartisan, particularly in matters of foreign policy. Here to help us uncover the sources of bipartisan cooperation in Congress is Dr. Jordan Tama, Provost Associate Professor at American University's School of International Service and author of the new book, Bipartisanship and U.S. Foreign Policy, Cooperation in a Polarized Age. Jordan, thanks for joining us here on The Debrief. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, let's start with your main argument. Um, how do you reach the conclusion, given all of the news coverage that we see today, uh, that Congress is marked by, free, by frequent bipartisanship, especially in matters of foreign policy? Yeah, it, it is a little surprising to suggest that there's a lot of bipartisanship on anything today. I think most people don't realize that. And so that's why I wrote the book, to show that um, even in our highly polarized political environment, there is still bipartisanship on many issues, and especially on foreign policy. And one of the ways I show this in the book is based on data I collected of congressional votes. So for the book, I created a database of all important congressional votes on legislation from 1991 to 20, 2020, so a 30-year period. This is more than 2,700 votes. And from that data, um, a few patterns are clear. One is that um, bipartisanship um, continues to occur often on foreign policy. So in fact, in a majority of foreign policy votes from 1991 to 2020, um, most Democrats and most Republicans in Congress voted the same way. Um, second uh, finding from that data is that bipartisanship occurs more often on foreign policy than on domestic policy. If you compare the foreign policy votes to the domestic policy votes, you can see that bipartisan voting occurs more often on the foreign policy ones. And the third finding is that um, the trend line is um, going in the wrong direction. So um, uh, over time, um, rates of bipartisan voting are declining. And so there is increased polarization in foreign policy. Uh, the story is not you know, overly optimistic. Um, uh, polarization is growing, but um, there's still a lot of bipartisanship too. So it's, it's a nuanced story. It's a story that's showing that um, we neither have overarching bipartisan consensus nor uh, prevailing partisan polarization, but a, a mix of bipartisanship and, and division on different issues. Now, you've suggested that bipartisanship is much more common in matters of international affairs relative to domestic policy. Why might that be the case for a lot of members of Congress? Yeah, so there are a few reasons why um, bipartisanship occurs often on foreign policy. One um, is that sometimes there are international threats that bring Democrats and Republicans together or perceived international threats. Um, this is the main reason why um, there was bipartisanship on a lot of issues during the Cold War. There was a sense of a threat from the Soviet Union. Um, after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, there was an uptick in bipartisanship based on a feeling of a, a, a threat from um, Al Qaeda. Um, and whenever there's a, a sense of some international uh, threat, this tends to pull the two parties together. Uh, so that explains some foreign policy issues. Um, uh, there's also often bipartisanship because a lot of foreign policy issues don't break down on a left-right ideological spectrum. So often we think about issues as having a liberal position and a conservative position. If you think about something like the government role in the economy, um, liberals generally favor a greater government role in terms of regulating businesses than conservatives do, or we think of tax levels. Liberals generally are more willing to increase taxes to fund social welfare programs than conservatives are. So on those kinds of issues, there's a clear left-right division. Um, and that naturally leads to polarization between the two parties, since uh, liberals are uh, represented in the Democratic Party, conservatives in the Republican Party. On many foreign policy issues, there's not this clear left-right um, division. If you take an issue like U.S. policy toward Ukraine or U.S. trade policy, there are not 
distinct liberal, liberal and conservative positions. So um, as a result, Democrats or Republicans could, could sort of find themselves in a, a number of different places in terms of what position they take on, on that type of issue. And then the third thing that um, can be a force for bipartisanship that um, is common in foreign policy is um, the advocacy groups that are active on an issue themselves have ties to both parties. So advocacy groups or interest groups can be important on many foreign policy issues, um, uh, as they can be important on domestic policy issues. And some of those um, groups um, are a force for bipartisanship because they've cultivated ties with both parties. So defense contractors um, have this characteristics when it comes to the defense budget. Generally, defense contractors have built relationships with Democratic and Republican politicians, and this maintains bipartisan support for defense spending. Um, some um, ethnic uh, communities in the United States or ethnic diaspora groups um, have been effective at cultivating ties uh, with both parties, and then you're, you're likely to see bipartisanship. On those on those fronts, yeah. And why why if bipartisanship is more common in the votes that you're looking at in terms of the legislation that Congress brings to the floor, uh, why do we get this sense? And even as you suggested, of this kind of creeping polarization that's starting yeah. to uh, emerge even within some of the voting patterns that you've observed. Is it the way that? rhetoric is talked about on the Hill? Is it the kind of uh, questioning in hearings or speeches uh, that gets coverage uh, more than others that tends to crowd out these maybe less visible uh, efforts at bipartisanship? Why does it seem like things are so polarized, even if, as you're suggesting, there's a lot more bipartisanship if you know where to look for it? Yeah. Um, well, part of it is that the media highlights conflict more than cooperation. The members of Congress who get the most attention are the ones who have the loudest voices, say the most provocative things, are kind of amplifying um, conflict rather than cooperating behind the scenes. So that's, as a result, what voters see. That's what the public um, sees. The public doesn't see the um, members of Congress who are working to forge agreements across party lines in a, in a quiet way, even though that's happening regularly in Congress and particularly many um, chair, uh, chairs of key committees, uh, the foreign policy committees are often working in a bipartisan way um, behind the scenes, but the public doesn't really see that. Um, also, um, uh, uh, presidential candidates in campaigns often highlight areas of difference because that's a way to draw distinctions between the parties and um, candidates who are challenging an incumbent will often um, highlight um, areas of difference with um, the incumbent. Um, and so during a presidential campaign you don't hear much about areas of commonality because it's not it's not compelling for an opposition candidate to say, yes, I agree with you, you know, uh, Mr. President. Uh, so, that's, so the differences are emphasized. And then the third reason is because the trend line is going in the wrong direction. So I think people, um, you know, think about an imagined uh, time in the past when there seemed to be more bipartisanship and they see uh, polarization growing. And so they, as a result, um, kind of emphasize in their thinking the... Um, way that the glass is half empty. In other words, polarization is rising, so it looks like the glass is half empty, even though the reality is the glass is still half full, because even though polarization has gone up, there's still a lot of bipartisanship. But since the trend line is going in the wrong direction, people um, focus more on the negative side than on the positive side. Now, commentators frequently like to quote Senator Arthur Vanderberg uh, and his exhortation that politics stop at the water's edge when it comes to foreign policy. Now, uh, you've argued and, and many others have concluded that that wasn't even true even in his own time. Um, but why do we have this sense or was the post-war period this period of a golden age of bipartisanship that uh, so many try to hearken back to uh, in their own uh, thinking around around this issue in Washington. Yeah, and the, the phrase politics stops at the water's edge is, I think, the most commonly used phrase when it comes to talking about the politics of, of foreign policy. Um, um, I think the majority of books on this topic, you know, put that in the title somehow. And with right. my book, I, I gave some thought to, you know, should I put politics in the water's edge, at stops at the water's edge in the title? I decided not to. Um, but in any case, um, there... Um, is some truth to the idea that there was a golden age of bipartisanship and that bipartisanship was more common during the Cold War than it is now. 
um, and especially in the early decades of the Cold War, say the period from 1945 through the middle of the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War led to um, increased divisions in foreign policy as that debate became contentious, but say from 1945 through the 1960s, um, there was a high watermark of bipartisanship. And um, you know, a couple examples of that, uh, during the Truman administration, the creation of NATO got strong bipartisan support. The Marshall Plan got strong bipartisan support. So some major foreign policy initiatives that were kind of developed and carried out in a, in a bipartisan way. And on some of those issues, the president even worked directly with the opposition in Congress. So Vandenberg was actually kind of brought into policymaking by the Truman administration in a way that we rarely, rarely see today. So, you know, when it came to um, things like developing NATO and the Marshall Plan, they were really consulting with him closely and working with him closely. But um, there were also highly um, partisan debates during the old war, early Cold War years. And so this idea of there being a golden age can kind of overlook the reality that then, as now, there was a mix of bipartisanship and polarization or partisanship. So during the Truman administration, there was a very partisan debate over who lost China um, when the you know Chinese um, Communist Revolution was successful in 1949. The Republicans jumped all over Truman on that, and they said it, this was Truman's fault for not, you know, uh, supporting the um, nationalists in China enough. Korean War, um, the Republicans also uh, sharply attacked Truman for um, not handling the Korean War um, better uh, for the United States. You know, not not um, winning that war as you got toward the 1952. Um, election. There was the McCarthy hearings where a Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy was attacking um, uh, Truman administration um, officials as, you know, perceived communists, and that was a partisan debate. Um, so that sometimes gets forgotten. So um, the balance was a little bit more bipartisan then than it is now, but in both periods, there are some debates that are bipartisan, some debates that are partisan. And so the, and the takeaway for me is really the politics vary across issues. We can't just generalize that, you know, foreign policy is bipartisan, foreign policy is partisan. It depends what, what issue you're talking about within foreign policy. Some of them generate more bipartisanship and some generate more partisanship. And also the parties were slightly different. The way that Congress, uh, you know, empowered committee chairs, uh, very different. Uh, that also perhaps explains some of those differences. Yeah. Um, now, divided government has become more frequent. That's where the president uh, affiliates with one party uh, and then over down Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, members of the opposition party control either one or both houses of Congress. Yeah. Um, how does this uh, increasing frequency of divided government shape perceptions of polarization in Washington, both for domestic audiences and those abroad? Yeah. Divided government does generate um, more visible divisions in foreign policy because the opposition party um, does tend to push back against the president more, um, does tend to uh, pursue investigations of the executive branch more. So when the opposition party is in control of the House or Senate, they can um, direct congressional investigations of the executive branch the president's party does not tend to do that. Um, and they can advance their own legislative initiatives that may be at odds with, with the president's agenda. And so generally under divided government, there is more tension um, between the branches um, and more public attention to that, more media attention to that, because that's what the media will, will focus on that. Um, that said, um, you know, divided government does not um, mean that everything becomes partisan when it's when when you're talking about foreign policy and under unified government not everything is easy either for the president so um, just to give um, a couple examples of how um, there can be bipartisanship e even under divided government during the Trump presidency uh, the Democrats controlled um, the uh, house in the latter part of the Trump administration, Trump negotiated the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, replacement of NAFTA. Um, Trump actually worked closely with congressional Democrats 
uh, the House Democrats that were running the House under divided government in negotiating the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, and that was approved by both the House and Senate, even though there was divided government at that time. That was one of Trump's real foreign policy achievements, and he did it under divided government. Um, under Biden, currently, you have Republicans controlling the House. Biden was able, after you know, uh, many months of um, wrangling, to work with the Republican leadership of the House, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson, to get the House to approve big aid package for Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan. That's another you know, big achievement under, under divided government. So, you know, again, it's a, it's a mix. You'll see under divided government more partisanship, um, in particular more investigations of the executive branch, which tend to be highly partisan, but also still possibilities for bipartisan cooperation. Right. Now, in addition to those divisions across Pennsylvania Avenue, um, your work has also pointed at the emergence of intra-party divisions, that mm -hmm. is, divisions within the parties uh, among different factions based on particular issues or particular ideological orientations, um, which can sometimes make for some strange bipartisan bedfellows. Uh, what factions do you see emerging within the two main uh, political parties today, and how has this affected uh, perceptions of foreign policy outcomes or vote outcomes uh, uh, across party lines. Yeah, the intra-party division is very common in, in foreign policy um, these days. On most foreign policy issues, there is a substantial degree of intra-party um, division. This is most evident um, now in the Republican Party, where there is a, a, a sharp uh, division um, between the internationalist, traditional, kind of Reaganite Republican wing of the party that favors a kind of muscular internationalism, um, a la Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush, uh, extensive international involvement, extensive mil U.S. military presence overseas, and then on the other side, the Trump um, wing of the party, um, the MAGA perspective, which is more um, nationalist, more inward-looking, more protectionist, um, skeptical of kind of overseas commitments. Um, and that played out, especially in the Ukraine aid debate, continues to play out, where the Republican Party is split over, over whether to support Ukraine. On the Democratic Party, the most salient um, intra-party division right now is over Israel policy, where you've got uh, a kind of, you know, some Democrats who um, share the long-standing position of most Democrats of uh, being uh, pretty pro-Israel. Biden is in that um, camp, although he's um, uh, also trying to balance support for Israel with support for Palestinian rights, but generally uh, pro-Israel. And on the other hand, um, progressive wing of the party that wants to distance the United States much more from, from Israel. Um, and. Um, these intra-party divisions um, complicate the making of U.S. foreign policy just as partisan polarization can complicate the making of U.S. foreign policy. So, you know, whether divisions are within the parties or between the parties, it makes it harder for Congress to act. It's harder to kind of build majorities in support of a policy, as was seen recently with, you know, aid for Ukraine, where even though, you know, this was... Uh, universally supported by Democrats because the Republican Party was split, it was very hard to get it through Congress. And so this is a complicating factor for for U.S. foreign policy. And you've suggested that the the direction or the trend line is one that's creeping towards greater polarization, even within these voting patterns. Um, I'm curious about what kind of messaging that sends or, or what effects it has on uh, the commitments that the United States makes, the credibility of the threats that it makes to adversaries. Uh, what effects do you see that having uh, on the world stage? Yeah, I, I, polarization, I think, is quite harmful for the U.S. role in the world. Um, it has a number of problematic effects. One is it makes it harder for Congress to pass legislation that's needed to address international challenges. And there are many foreign policy issues where legislation is needed. Not everything. Some things the president can do through the president's own authority. But often, if, if you need money for something, uh, always Congress has to act in order to make that happen. So that's one piece. Um, also, 
polarization um, reduces the reliability of U.S. commitments. It makes it harder for the United States to sustain commitments over time. Uh, so if you're a foreign government, if you're an ally or partner of the United States and you're looking at the United States, you might see the current president make a commitment, but then you have to wonder, is the Congress going to back up this commitment? Are they going to you know, provide the resources needed to sustain it? Um, is the next president going to continue this commitment, or are they going to take U.S. policy in a different direction? And we've seen recent presidents um, often pull out of international agreements. Trump pulled out of several agreements that Obama had negotiated. Um, and so when that happens, it reduces the, the, rep the reliability of U.S. commitments, um, harms the reputation of the United States, gives other countries less incentive to cooperate with the U.S. in the first place, and as a result, makes it harder for the world to address international problems because the, the U.S. Is, is central to addressing a lot of international problems. If other countries don't feel that they can uh, rely on U.S. commitments or don't have as much incentive to cooperate with the United States, then it's going to be harder for the world to act uh, collectively. So, I, so that's a very big problem. So uh, is there any hope for uh, some kind of continued bipartisan cooperation even as the trend lines are pushing towards more polarization and uh, uh, any particular issue areas where we think there might be uh, uh, some continued bipartisanship uh, uh, and working together uh, on the world stage? Yeah, there are issues where conditions will remain ripe for bipartisanship. Um, China policy is one of those. On China, there's not a lot of daylight between Democrats and Republicans these days. There are differences of nuance, but generally both parties support steps to counter Chinese influence, enhance the U.S. position relative to China in both the security domain and the economic domain. Congress has passed a lot of legislation um, oriented towards strengthening the U.S. position vis-a-vis -vis, um, China in, in recent years from uh, legislation that supports Taiwan, to legislation to invest in uh, domestic semiconductor industry to enhance uh, America's ability to uh, have economic in independence from China, to placing um, sanctions on China for uh, human rights violations in Xinjiang and um, Hong Kong. So there's all, all kinds of areas where bipartisanship can occur on, on uh, China. Trade policy is also an area that um, is ripe for more bipartisanship. Uh, generally, uh, Biden and Trump have similar approaches on, on trade. Democrats and Republicans in Congress um, do as well. In general, the, the trajectory of trade policy for both parties is in a uh, more protectionist direction um, oriented towards investing in domestic manufacturing to strengthen U.S. competitiveness with uh, foreign manufacturers. Um, there is still bipartisanship in support of NATO. Trump is a bit of an outlier on that. He's questioned the value of NATO, but most Republicans and pretty much all Democrats continue to support um, NATO. Uh, in general, there's bipartisan support for uh, U.S. military alliances and military presence overseas, you know, overall, and, you know, including places like Korea, Japan. Um, so there are a number of areas where there is bipartisanship. There are other issues that I think will probably remain polarized in, um, on foreign policy. Climate change is polarized. Immigration is polarized. So you know I expect it to be um, a mix. Um, and then the the kind of wild card is international events. So things can happen in the world that shake up politics. That um, create more bipartisanship. So I think if there are national security crises, if the U.S. gets into a real um, conflict with China, um, uh, if Russia makes deeper advances um, in Ukraine or possibly, you know, threatens other parts of Eastern Europe, you know, these are the kinds of things that could um, prompt um, stronger bipartisanship. If Iran, you know, uh, attacks Israel in a larger way, um, those are all, th you know, things that are kind of on the horizon as, as wild cards. But even in the absence of those, I think there'll still be um, areas of bipartisanship.
Well, I think um, you've given us at least uh, uh, an ability to see the glass at least half full uh, when it comes to uh, seeing some more bipartisanship when we uh, know where to look for it. And at least it gives me a little bit more hope that uh, uh, bipartisanship is, is still alive and well. So I uh, just want to thank you, Jordan, for uh, joining us here on The Debrief. Thanks so much. It was really a pleasure to talk with you.